it's your turn. And uh, Ernest, can you come up, please? Join us here. We have our speakers here. Ernest Goitein was project engineer for three nuclear power plants, and then he quit in 1981 to become an anti-nuclear activist based on this information, and he was essential. in the work to stop the Ward Valley uh, radioactive waste dump. So, questions? Yes, sir. Well, this is not mainly to you, actually. Um, first of all, I honor your work with uh, Ward Valley. I know a lot about it. And uh, I encourage others to learn more about it. But uh, <coughs> I, I actually have a comment, and then maybe you could respond uh, for the panel. Uh, 22 years ago, uh, about 20 Native Americans from different tribes, uh, they, they did what's called a run for life. And they started on the East Coast, they came to San Francisco, and then they went on to Japan. They stopped at all these different nuclear plants to protest. And honoring their ancestors uh, who had prophecies about the more you go against nature, the more disaster you're going to create. Uh, the more you try to control nature, the more you don't and nature will have the last word. And Native American people that I know said, you know, you people need a revolution to create a system that puts environmental sustainability way ahead of anything else that's not going to happen for the Democrats. Okay. Anyone want to respond? I'm very, you ask, thank you very much. You ask very philosophical question because it is a revolution of paradigm. This is paradigm revolution. So, because, uh, uh, yes, we really, we really very close to revolution because the open system is coming and we understand now contradictory between closed system where military core and where nuclear weapons was created and the open system where we live. And when we talk about if Japan have his own energy resources, I ask what world leave Japan? Is it closed system or is it open system? If Japan politician cannot negotiate with the other country about energy resources. So this is the main revolution what we are live now. This is changes of paradigm. Power don't want changes the paradigm. They want to stay in the closed system, states, institutions, and uh, any type of one. Okay, question. <coughs> uh, two questions, one sort of minor than the other. I think I just wanted to point out too in Germany that they are, uh, have shut down their plants and they're saying that they're going to get rid of them all by 2020, which is an amazing contradiction of what we're doing here. Um, and so, the, but the other kind of technical question, I keep hearing this, well, why don't they just dump concrete on it? Like that's going to stop all the problems in Fukushima. So if people could respond to that of why that's crazy. Uh, you asking me? Yeah. <laughs> um, I really don't know enough about the situation in Fukushima to answer that, so I can't say. Uh, certainly, I have a question for sure about uh, what's happening at Chernobyl. Is it still going on? Is the f uh, f uh, fusion or the f uh, fission still going on inside the sarcophagus? Uh, it is heating inside of sarcophagus because this is feature of fissile material. They will live until plutonium is will go on. It is, it is million, two million years. Yes. So, and this is, you cannot stop. When this guy from Fukushima tried to stop yes. physical reaction by the water, <coughs> It was so, and and you and blow up my mind. How it happened? What they are doing? They all only increase the volumes of radiation in the air. So this is um, when Fukushima. I, it was very interesting picture in one of my slides when the Fukushima. Um, 
когда этот поток селевой шел на дорогу, Face to face, face to face with this uh, um, uh, wave flow of mud, and one one bus stop and try to turn to the field and stop. And for me, this picture I have this picture in the uh, in the in that presentation. So how short time for decision making we have in such difficult situation. So and this is. This is uh, when we talk about Chernobyl, and you saw this from film of uh, from Fukushima and Chernobyl. When something happens, people it paralyzes mind of the. It stopped our ability to do decision making, even we have short time, and psychological effect. So and uh, so this is this is means that. We are faced with very difficult technology, with, uh, which is applied um, very, I would say, dangerous. Uh, dangerous. Uh, and uh, people can't cope just with this yeah. because uh, it's beyond our ability to make decisions with this short cold period mind, of time. With cold to mind to make yeah. analyze and put in synthesis to make synthesis of different cause in the very short moment. It is only computer made of it, without any emotions. But the computer's input should be, but there is no input yeah. when it goes. I'd just like to, to add a, a point yeah, on this. Yeah. 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 I can add that every radioactive accident, accident which had already happened, they are quite individual. В одном случае человеческий фактор, в другом технический, природный, natural disaster. И в каждой радиационной аварии один, два, три различные модели совмещения. There are very different one, two, three models of being a complex. И не важно это или радиоактивные отходы, хранящиеся после ядерной индустрии. Или это электростанции, которые получают мирный, как называемый, и модели для каждого реактора, для каждого ситуации просчитать очень трудно, какие из них когда западут. Но зато очень можно хорошо высчитать, если произойдет где-либо такая авария, that if such an accident of uh, any type happened anywhere, activists uh, yes, the activists and activists in uh, Greenpeace in Russia, Russia uh, they made a model. Yeah. They took uh, nuclear power plants in Russia and they blew them up, you see, in a model. 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 And model. And they they showed a model where radioactive, radioactive um, radioactive contamination or footprints or fallout will be in the cold period of time. And it's impossible to predict beforehand what will, how the situation will develop and what will be the outcome. It's impossible. I'd just like to add a, a couple of points on this. One is for those who are interested in this question of decision making for systems like nuclear power, there's a book called Normal Accidents by Perot, P E R R O W, that's worth looking at, um, who talks specifically about the distinctive difficulties posed by technologies that are counterintuitive, remotely instrumented, and have uh, uh, distinctive and uh, sort of sui generis chain of accident events. Um, and as for uh, concrete in this facility, three reactors, four fuel pools that are highly problematic, two other operating reactors, and three fuel pools, including a larger collective one behind the plant, it's a very, very complex problem. And it's in an earthquake zone, which yeah. makes it an even more complex. And, and also, also, when you have a when you have a um, 
Нет, нет, нет. Когда у вас технический реактор, и его можно контролировать, да, тогда можно говорить о каком-то съеме тепла и так далее. Но когда это yes. уже авария, reactor, walking, cooling the system of taking uh, heat from it and going and taking just cooling it again. But when you have an accident, it's not и уже you know, ты не знаешь, что внутри реактора. Поэтому вот когда был вопрос, а что в Чернобыле, а мы не знаем, When, что в Чернобыле. Was, И мы не можем там сделать это вот систематизированное охлаждение, even, ничего. Потому что там все спекло. We can't cool it or do anything because everything inside yes, is melted. Yes. You okay. see, it's like uh, a mess which we can't even measure or know what the physical situation is. When it comes to spent fuel pools, I also like to say, in the United States, the spent fuel pools have a lot more uh, charges in than Fukushima because Fukushima Uh, is pulling them out to get uh, uh, to get recycled, uh, to get um, uh, processed in France and in England and now in Rokashu. So we in the United States, what they did, they reconfigured the spent fuel pool. They put the spent fuel closer together, <coughs> so you have like uh, five or six loads in the spent fuel pool which when that goes, you have a much, much greater act, uh, yeah. problem than yeah. in a reactor meltdown even. Because okay, <laughs> question, yeah, man. Yeah, um, so I, I, can, I have a, a, a slightly different thing. Actually, I, I disagree a little bit with the idea that it's only a revolution of a paradigm change. And I'd like to hear what uh, the panel has to, what the panel thinks about that. I mean. When you, when you think about it, you know, I, I actually think that a lot of the people, the very, very few people who actually do have control over the, over the, um, the types of energy that we produce in our societies um, do know what the threats of, of um, climate change are, do know what the threats of nuclear power are. I mean, President Obama is a very smart man. Um, and he actually entered into his campaign um, with, with a green thumb, right? Uh, he he was he was going to um, you know he was going to establish a green czar. Um, we were going to have all sorts of new technologies that were going to be developed, solar, wind. Um, but instead, the only kind of green technology that he's actually put money towards is green nuclear power, right? Um, in fact, 36 billion dollars towards green nuclear power. Um, and of course, we're seeing right now. Um, Nuclear power is nothing but a hell of a way to boil water, right? Yeah. Um, and so, and so, um, and so, I think that what what we actually, well, there is actually a difference between um, the impact that um, that the crises that are the ecological crises that are created by these unsustainable types of of energy. Um, there is a difference between the way that they affect the ruling class that has control over them and the way that they affect us. I mean, we, you, you, I've even heard, um, and, and the name of this person is escaping me, I really wish I had it on, on my tongue, but um, there is a uh, politician um, and even even some scientists around him who are talking about building up a, a great wall around the United States when climate change really takes effect. And that, like, and that, um, and so, and so that, that, that would keep not only the water from rising above, but also from immigrants who would be migrating south into our, into our country, right? And so you have, like, I mean, it's basically, and, and again, you see, I think that also what we see is that, like, with, with the hurricane, with Hurricane Katrina, with also the disaster in Haiti, from the earthquake in Haiti, you see that actually the ruling class takes these crises and finds ways to actually profit off of them, right? Um, creating new markets from immiseration, new definitely. markets from crisis. So my question is, what do you think, sorry, um, what do you think, <laughs> you brought up the point of social movements, that, that we actually need social movements, and I totally agree, because you know even our, our green president, Barack Obama, is not really gonna do what we need. So what do you think a social movement would have to look like? How far do you think it would have to go? Um, and I also wanted to plug that after this at 7 p.m., um, Chris Williams will be speaking on um, ecology and socialism at uh, 
at uh, the what is it? Mo modern times in uh, at Valencia and Twenty Street. Okay, so you should check question. it out. It should be good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the question is, what kind of social moment? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, this is the, the, yeah, the sure. other 15 minutes of my talk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you can stay for a while. You know, um, when, when you look at the technology choices, I mean, one of the problems with um, not just capitalist worldviews, but most of the um, socialist and communist worldviews that actually took state power anywhere is they tended to treat technology choice as essentially neutral, right? And, you know, I've been working on, on nuclear weapons and nuclear power stuff for a long time, and I've done a lot of international work, and one of the things that really is striking is how much the institutions resemble each other, regardless of whether, you know, how they're juridically defined, whether they're public or private, whether they're, you know, operating in uh, a very lightly regulated corporate capitalist context like the United States, or whether they're completely a state enterprise like in India. Um, you know, the, the technology both is chosen to fit a particular kind of global economy with global supply chains that mainly produce goods and services that only the top 20% of the world's population can afford to buy. They're deployed by these very large organizations and most of that 20% are the people who work and profit from those same large organizations. And the bottom 80% is increasingly marginalized. And to me, that split and that growing chasm is the most important political and social fact of the period we're in. And if you start looking at moving towards um, decentralized um, alternative energy, there's also reasons why that path you know, is more suitable. It's, it's, it's easier to decentralize. You can deploy it in smaller amounts. You can do it a village at a time and not in these massive capital chunks of many billion dollars that commit you to a technology at a particular developmental point for 30 or 40 years at a time so your learning curve issues are better. There's a whole alternative technology path. But the, um, the uh, impediments to pursuing it are political, are the concentrated power of these existing institutions. So yeah. maybe that guy will talk uh, about this. In I would time. like to add, you, you forget about question. What about social movement? This is, yeah. I think this is a key of your question because a lawyer cannot, cannot talk uh, outside of political frame because it's very, it is very, yes, it is paradigm, it is paradigm. When you are understand what is open system paradigm, you start to understand the values of uh, complex system approach, values of self-organization, values of social movement. That's my, that's my book about the role of social, the role of civil civil socium, this is like socium, it is European term, the role of civil society in modern state governance. So we are living when the roles, roles of the power elite and civil socium, civil society are changes and this is what I talk about revolution. So that's, that's why I try to talk with Americans we are in a very turning point with Fukushima. We need to organize multi-level brainstorming initiated by civil social, by public group, by social groups, and develop our own step, our own road, I would say road map yeah. with steps how we need to, how we have to use this Fukushima case to turn to the safe environment and sustainable uh, life. I just, I just want to give a point of pri yeah. pers personal yeah. privilege here. Um, I was on the coordinating council of the Livermore Action Group, which was a large direct action oriented um, yeah. group yeah, yeah, opposing sure. nuclear power in the 1980s. And, and for those who are interested, I just wrote a piece in the uh, in Disarmament Forum, which is uh, the publication of the uh, United Nations Disarmament Research Institute on civil society and disarmament, which you can find on the web if you're interested. I just feel that you Okay, so we have, we have more questions. And That's what the question. Yes, first of all, I'm going to ask you to talk about the 
of all, I would like to say thank you so much for the lecture. I, I thought it was amazing. Um, I am an IR student, a master's IR student here in international relations, and I really want to ask a policy question. Um, I've actually taken an international and environmental policy class right now, and I'm wondering, is there um, international environmental regimes that are governing this, or putting any safety restrictions? I can only think of like the hazardous waste regime, the Basel Convention, but is there anything else? And my second part of that question is, do you think that what happened in Fukushima would actually spur maybe a new uh, convention or a new regime? Internationally speaking. Uh, the first of all, of course, we have international body, IAEA. IAEA have uh, six agreements with with World Health Organization, with um, uh, Agriculture and Food Organization, with Meteorological Organization, with uh, United Nations Scientific Organization, and two more. So this is like institution. So what you, ma ma you what you have to change as a new generation, you need to change this institution. This is first. Second, we have, of course, some international agreements about um, SEA, uh, uh, yes, SEA, and so th this is a number convention which unfortunately excluded when it is something like unpredictable type of cause. This is like, and this is the problem. So we need, uh, so your generation need to re critical reading of this old convention and do this convention more strong and more accountable for governance. That's do you think that Fukushima's uh, incident is going to create that? No, if we don't. No, no, I, no, think without so. social no I think without so. Social moment, no. I, I think so, but we without social movement. No. Yeah. <laughs> but, but you need to know. That what I can to say after Fukushima, I each day I look only one week take from power lead to self organize, wow. and we are forcefulated. We are not self organized. So this is how we slowly compare comparison us with power lead. So we're going to hang out for a few more minutes, but before we take more questions, I'd like to ask Kate Fisher, who came here. She's a, a graduate student in Asian American Studies who's working with an organization that's supporting the people of Japan. Would you like to speak to us? And I'll hand those out oh, while you do that. So, yeah, thank you Come so much here. for having me. Oh, thank you. And I really appreciate the panelists for coming here today and sharing with us your knowledge. Um, and, and sort of to answer that question about Fukushima, uh, I, I, know, I work with community organizations in Japan and uh, and my organization is called Eclipse Rising and we're working with another nonprofit in the Bay Area called Japan Pacific Resource Network and together we've created a fund for the people of Japan but especially the minority communities that the most underserved communities that are impacted not just by the tsunami and the earthquake of course but now the the radiation leak that's that's going on in the Fukushima area and to sort of respond to your question about whether the incident in Fukushima will cause a social movement I think in general in in Japan I think there are, I, my numbers might be a little bit incorrect but I believe there are about 56 nuclear reactors all throughout the country and which and I, in the United States I think there's four wow. nuclear plants so or in California I'm sorry just in California alone I think there are only four nuclear plants is that right so in Japan and California are roughly the same size so if you can just imagine this extremely earthquake prone country with nuclear plants built knowingly on fault lines it's yeah. it's it and the people I think are definitely a, against nuclear power plants in general and what sort of not talked about in the media is there is a social movement people do protest before the nuclear power plants are built and the community of course doesn't want a nuclear power plant in their backyard and what happens many times is um, the people who end up living around the nuclear power plants who end up working there are are the 
are the minority, so they're the Burakumin, who are the uh, sort of the untouchable caste of Japan. They're the Zainichi Koreans, who who uh, there's a million or so commun um, Zainichi Koreans in Japan who are there because of um, Japanese colonialism of Korea. And now, more recently, they're migrant workers from um, poor countries in Southeast Asia and uh, also Latin America. So I think there's a, there's a lot of overlap in terms of how how the uh, nuclear uh, the radiation leak is impacting Japan as a society but most specifically these more vulnerable communities and so um, in light of that I, I'd really love to bring attention to this fund that we've created it's called the Japan Multicultural Relief Fund and JPRN has actually uh, done a similar fund in the 1995 Kobe earthquake and uh, which uh, there not only did it impact um, sort of the communities of color, for lack of a better term, uh, uh, at that time, but um, but also there was a lot of um, inequality in how relief aid was distributed to Japanese communities versus the so-called non-Japanese or the minorities. And so our fund is extremely specific. We are fundraising, and you know, besides all the administrative costs. 100% of it is going directly to uh, six organizations that we have worked with and that we're familiar with in Japan. And they work with the Burakumi community, they work with uh, the Korean schools in the area, they work with um, uh, an organization that supports uh, comfort women or uh, women who were sexual slaves during the Japanese war, also migrant workers, also homeless and uh, day laborers. and. Um, and also disabled people. And so, if you can, if you can, please just take a few minutes of your time to go to that website, tell your friends, post it on Facebook, whatever you can do to please um, uh, get the word out about this fund. We'd really appreciate it. So, thank you. Thank you for the time. Thank you. Yes, of course, we should hope, we should, we should be, we actually have a legal obligation to be moving towards the elimination of nuclear weapons under Article 6 of the uh, Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, the part of it that doesn't tend to get talked about a lot uh, here in the United States. Um, generally speaking, uh, right now, in a country like the United States, uh, there, as, as one official said, we are awash in... Uh, uh, the materials needed to make nuclear weapons. The United States doesn't need any more nuclear material to make nuclear weapons, which you get out of nuclear reactors, right? You essentially get the material from nuclear reactors. But we have enough here. That remains an issue in other countries, like, for example, India and Pakistan that have developing nuclear arsenals. Um, the facilities where nuclear weapons are manufactured um, typically are somewhat less dangerous than a, a nuclear power plant where you're actually just putting the weapons together um, just because you don't have the very specific problems that we've been talking about with nuclear power plants. But they're still dangerous. And right now, the United States is, can you guess it, proposing to build a great big new nuclear facility, a plutonium facility, um, in a seismically active area at the Los Alamos National Laboratory in New Mexico. So these struggles go on in a number of different venues. Yeah, and uh, one minute. And you know that Fissile Material Convention discussed more than 20 years. Uh, Two days ago, I met a guy from State Department, and we talk. We have a big talk with Alliance for Nuclear Accountability about this uh, international space of the law and space of the nuclear materials, military materials. And guess who stay against this uh, convention. Uh, convention? Pakistan. Yeah, Pakistan. And they so can't. it is oh. like uh, this was very funny, but uh, 20 years Pakistan prevented this convention. So that's 
that's sometimes it is big play game between between politi politicians because nuclear weapons became artifact of power. This is like star on your general apparatus. Yeah. So, and if if you are polit if you are if you want to be a member of this power golf club, you need to have. Nuclear. Yes. <laughs> so, instead of your question. question. Seeing how we can't really trust uh, governments and many agencies like the EPA to tell us the truth about the magnitude of a lot of these situations, what would you uh, suggest are the most practical steps to take for like, kind of like, I don't know, detecting like what exactly radioactive fallout can have like the effect it can have on our population. Well, <laughs> first of all, my question was to Japanese. You are so high, high tech nation. Where is your dosimeters? Where is Where your dosimeter? Because the, I took dosimeter in my flight. I know how much uh, radiation I took, took from the um, five thousand kilometers of sun, ten thousand kilometers of sun. The first is. The picture what you see first, it was also developed like um, um, initi initiatively. So we have a lot of independent scientific group. Uh, we ha we live in the global uh, community now, global village. It is mm, I, I'm sorry. It is now we have a much more opportunity than we had in Chernobyl situation. So what we need to develop, we need to develop this our global accountability and networks for information. So, and the, we need to be global WikiLeaks. Yeah. 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 <laughs> that is that is the way. There, there's a, back to the social movements again. There's also a relationship between social movements and the way that government agencies, regulatory agencies, and so forth function. When you have periods of high social mobilization and relatively effective social movements, People who are working within government agencies, regulatory agencies, and so forth um, are more likely to reveal information that they have about what's actually going on inside. You get more distant information from scientists and technical people and so forth within government agencies whose positions and investigations are being suppressed. And this has been true. You know, the Pentagon Papers actually was a large illustration of this. You know, Daniel Ellsberg will tell you that he was inspired by people who were resisting at the, the war in the street because he had access to information that could really have a significant effect. And on a more local level, in the 1980s, there was a big struggle to keep a whole bunch of nuclear cruise missile armed ships from being based right here yeah. in the San Francisco Bay Area. And there was a very mobilized social movement against that. And there was a lot of leaking from the environmental agencies about you know, various effects um, to the, the, the groups that are working on that. So there's, there's kind of a synergistic effect between, you know, again, a mobilized civil society gives you more democracy in many different ways. And, and, and the building block is, is, yeah. is um, social movement. And a nonprofit organization in California, California Communities Against Toxic, Toxics, is now working to buy these uh, radiation alert um, machinery to have citizens go out and monitor and have a way for that information to be collected to compare with what the official statement is. I also like to see what you said earlier about taking the seminar and the plane. The accident is so much worse because you take particles that you ingest and they rest against your, uh, against your cells and they'll destroy those cells and cause cancer. Whereas radiation from cosmic radiation, while it's harmful, it's not nearly as harmful as... <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's the point I want to make. Yes, sir. medium and long-term effects. Um, I feel like we don't have that much information about Chernobyl, and until there is that information, people aren't going to mobilize at all because, I mean, I, I was just wondering the last 25 years, what 
specific research has been done to look at the, the cancer rates um, in the affected areas compared to the non-affected areas. Is there that type of evidence that shows how much more they um, these patches, radioactive patches, have affected cancer rates? First of all, of course, we have a big clash between clash between official uh, between official position of medical person like World, World Health Organization and uh, scientists who work on the ground, and that's why a number of Belarusian science was arrested and was prevented to publicize the material, because the, so, uh, according to the law, before this information go through the norm, you need to have publicized in, uh, in special journals, and only after a number of publications, this information uh, uh, became, uh, uh, became uh, accountable, by, accountable uh, by the government. So this is like, also we need to rewrite this this all these rules of the information and this creates some kind of mis, uh, misleading information officials say only 1000 deaths we say 600,000 deaths in the future because it is not only a, a, a fireman who was burned and received external huge external radiation but also you need to understand what means internal radiation and cells cells damage and membrane damage for the tenth generation ahead. Yes, for your pra pra how to say grand 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 kids. Yes, and yeah, I know that uh, our now our scientists discuss this phenomena of apoptose when your cells. Uh, have a massive immediate death, yes, and uh, your line of the life may be cut. So this is like quite interesting scientific field, a lot of scientists involved, but also you need to, we need to create rules. Yes, sir. Yes. Don't you think like the problem of the nuclear problem is like conflict of interest between like the political lobby and the social movement? And this government, like of the U.S. and uh, Russia, they know that's going to happen. Probably people they're going to die, and the environment's going to affect it. But they're going to like go ahead to the whatever they they want to do because there is like benefits, military advantage, so they're going to you know govern the world. So so there is no way to avoid the problem. They know like five. There is a risk of maybe five thousand every like ten years, twenty years. Some some people they're going to die. But they're going to do it. Like, if they're going to go to war, and they know so there is some collateral damage that's going to happen, so they have to do it because it's, they, they have to do it, that's all. So there is no uh, way to avoid the problem. Well, you know, I mean, we, we need um, social movements of unprecedented scope. And they need to be internationalist in ways that they have never been. Now, we may not succeed in constructing, but, you know, there's a good argument that the human species is at a fundamental branching point, and we are either going to change our ways very significantly in the next decade or two, or there is going to be a very significant crash in the human population. And and extensive uh, global eco ecological damage and violence. Um, at the same time. Well, a great deal of violence, most likely. So, you know, history is a harsh judge. We're, we're, we're going to um, construct the movements, or we aren't. Um, there will be forces in governments, of course, and other concentrated, um, concentrated economic powers and so forth that push back, and they seem to have all of the power right now. But what, another thing that's distinctive about social movements is they're also very hard to predict. And at the moments before their emergence, people often are feeling very isolated and like there's nothing happening. And then you have some triggering series of events and things change. Yeah, I do remember that uh, the war in Iraq 2003, what the WMD thing, you know. Everybody knows there is no WMD. A lot of people, they want a demonstration. 
because they know it's just like an excuse to go to war, you know. And uh, they went to the war and they did whatever they wanted to do. People, they died, but people, they still like suffer the consequences, you know. And always like the dumping, the waste of dumping in the coast of Africa, you know, people, they know about that. But still, you know, I mean, I think the problem is who, who's the strongest of the equation, you know. Not who's right who is, and who's wrong. Who is because decision maker? Who is decision maker? And what we need to change and what is more revolution? The now power elite is decision maker, uh, but we need to do, we need to social movement make decision maker. So the, play, the roles need to be changed in this, in this social theater. The, that's what we need to understand also. We need to change our roles. Yeah, but if you're so imagine this, folks, in the 1980s, a million people in the streets yeah. demanding a nuclear freeze. Yeah. Hundreds of thousands of people protesting yeah. at different nuclear power plants yeah. around the United States. We've seen this before, mm -hmm. and it can happen again. So how about just a couple more questions, and then we'll let these folks rest. Okay, yes, sir. On public documentaries for education, because I think that's the main important thing we lack. Um, how do we, is there a list we can put our names on with you guys? Like, is, professionals and all this, people who want to contribute and actually do something rather than just sit here and hear you guys talk. How would they contact the yes. Center for Sa Safe Energy? Uh, yeah. Through, through, through the Center for Safe Energy and also I will give my contacts and it is very important to produce more evidence because what I use, it is produced initiatively by the people, by the students. So they yeah. gave visual material, very important, because my, is, uh, my, my, language, my language is quite soft. S but uh, special for this case, I prepared this visual, visual material which support this soft scientific language. Uh, why are we pursuing nuclear energy when we are safe for cleaner, cheaper energy? Is it because nuclear energy is linked to the purpose of building nuclear weapons or Absolutely. the opposite? Absolutely. That's what Only one. That's Only what? one case. If we ban nuclear weapons, the nuclear, nuclear energy died themselves peacefully. Go on from this side. Peacefully. I'd like to say one thing about uh, uh, nuclear power and global warming. The nuclear plant produces saturated steam, and any of you engineering uh, know that the efficiency of a plant is based on the temperature into the turbine and the rejection in the condenser. It's called the Carnot cycle. Because saturated steam is a low temperature compared to a conventional fossil plant, um, the efficiency is only about 35%, whereas a modern fossil plant could be 55%. That's a 20% difference. Where does it go? It goes into the lakes, into the air, and the cooling towers. It, and uh, if you think the United States has 20% nuclear power, Think of 20% of the energy generate electric energy generated. Of that 20%, another 20% is rejected into the environment. That's yeah. a huge amount. I never hear it mentioned. Yeah. And I hope you guys yeah. spread the word. When Bill was talking about the anti-nuclear movement in the 80s, also in the 90s, there were attempts to make low-level radioactive waste dumps all over the country, and they were stopped by social movements. They weren't even organized together. They were done location by location. So social movements can and do make change. You just don't hear about them in the mainstream press. So don't get discouraged. Thanks for coming out, and most especially for very thought-provoking and a presentation by our guest speakers. Thank you so much.